to talk about mental health, but I'm going to focus on our mental health in our children. Whether you have children or you don't have children, it doesn't really matter. It seems to be an epidemic right now. I'm sure you have a niece or a nephew or a friend's child who's got this issue. But first I want to start with the story behind my story, because I have personal experience with this. When I was in my 20s, I was told medically that I would never have any children. And I found this to be a death sentence. And that might seem a bit extreme, but a backstory behind that story was when I was 13, my parents divorced. I had a very large extended family that I loved, and I lost that too. So I made this promise to myself. I'm sure all of you, when you were young, made promises to yourself that when I got older, I was going to meet the right man <laughs> with a big family. I was going to have kids and I would just continue my story that I lost. I was gonna have three kids. So fast forward again, being told I couldn't have any children, that marriage dissolved because I could have it medically, but he was not, uh, not ready for that. So I started, uh, I hooked up with a male friend of mine. We dated and uh, a medical miracle happened. In five months, I was pregnant. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I didn't have any medical intervention, nothing happened. I was also told that if I got pregnant, I'd have a 99.9% uh, .9 chance of having a tubal pregnancy. So it took me six months, six weeks, sorry, six weeks to find out if that was the case, and it wasn't. So fast forward again, I gave birth to a beautiful, bubbly, happy, red-headed little girl, and um, we bought a house got married. Six weeks after we got married, he left me. So there came my second worst nightmare. I was now a single mom. I think what bothered me the most is I didn't want my child to go through what I went through as a child. I had a plan, right? So guess what? I just made another plan. <laughs> I was going to find another man, and he was going to be a great father, and I uh, just continue my life. So when she was four, I did meet a man that she now calls dad. She, uh, she had a relationship with her own father. But the main thing was I was determined that she wasn't going to suffer from this. Because a lot of people, as we know, we've experienced it. It's, divorce is hard. And uh, I thought I did all right. She was happy. She was bubbly. She visited her father. We raised her. She loved her new father. She had two dads until she was uh, 14, and I was uh, at home. My 14-year-old came home, and her eyes, were, her eyes were dead. They were dark. They had, uh, lo she had lost her soul, basically. So the first thing that came to my mind was, uh, did you do drugs? She barely could shake her head no. So the next day, uh, I, I suffer from panic attacks, so I thought, I think she's having a full-blown panic attack, but she didn't know what that was. So the next day, I took her to the doctor, where she told the doctor her plan for suicide. And uh, it's going to be hard. <laughs> that was the beginning of the rest of our life. She went to the hospital. Twelve hours later, I watched her leave in an ambulance to CAPE, which is a mental health uh, unit for adolescents. And uh, two weeks later, she came home diagnosed with depression, anxiety, suicidal tendency, OCD. Later on, misophonia, which you may not know of, but it's an extreme sensitivity to sound. And uh, so that began our journey. What I found myself, and this, this title of this talk is It's Not Your Fault, because I found myself explaining to people that this was due to a relationship that she had with her biological father. And I had no idea. And her severe anxiety around abandonment. So her OCD was around convincing herself stories that she had to make sure that the house was locked up, that the stove was off three times. And each three times was also three times. <laughs> it would take her hours to get to bed because she knew my love was undying. She knew I wouldn't leave her. She knew her new father wasn't going to leave her, but she was convinced that then we would die 
that's how we would disappear. So this maddening, if you can imagine, going on in this 14-year-old mind uh, created a lot of anxiety, a lot of medical treatment, which if you asked me a few years ago if I'd have her on medicine, I would have said, hell no. <laughs> but what do you do? It's a life or death, right? And I found myself explaining to people that, oh, we're dealing with my daughter's mental health, but this is because of her relationship with her biological father and abandonment issues. And as I was saying that, I'm listening to myself going, why am I explaining this to people? As if I'm telling them, this is not my fault. I didn't do this to her. And I, we went to many therapists' appointments. I'd have to sit there for an hour while she was in session. I would watch parents come in and out with their children with all kinds of looks on their faces, anguish, frustration, sadness, angry, frustrated. Not just the parents, the children too. Detachment. And all I could see was that I wanted to go up to both of them. I wanted to go up to both the parents and the children and say, this is not your fault. This is a journey. Now, as, as she continued uh, with her treatment, I found myself doing a lot of research. And another place in this where we can feel at fault is when we start to want to fix it. We want to make it go away. And so you start going after the medical industry. We need more therapy. I need more care. She needs more help. And then what about the parents? We need more therapy. We need more care. We need more help. And it, it's inundated. It's an epidemic. But the difference is, I struggle with that word epidemic, is that this is not like it was when there was scarlet fever or you know, when things happen in Haiti and you've got hospitals and churches and schools and auditoriums filled with people and everybody in the community coming to help them in any way that they can, whether you were nurses or doctors or you just wanted to let somebody cry on your shoulder or bring them food. That's not happening now. We don't talk to each other about it. There seems to be this shame or this blame that's attached. And I think if anything that you take away from this is that I want people to reach out. If, you, if it's, this is happening to you, talk to people. When they say, are you okay, tell them, I'm not okay. <laughs> this is hard. If you know someone who's going through this, ask them if they're okay. Don't give them advice um, unless they ask. <laughs> but do ask if there's okay, if there's anything that they can do, if there's any way that, they can, um, that you can help them in any way. I'll tell you a couple of stories with this. I would have to, the anxiety was so serious with my daughter and I did a lot of research and I knew a lot about myself with adrenal glands and flight or fight. She was a very expressive child so she didn't internalize much. So I found myself um, teaching her how to kick her feet in the air so she could let out the adrenaline because it was in her head just making her crazy. Um, Suicide was a constant thing. We were on suicide watch 24-7. In fact, I'll never forget a story where, this might be a hard one, where she was missing. So her friends were, um, she was supposed to meet friends downtown, and uh, she had changed her mind. Her boyfriend was still thought that she was going to be downtown. So we had no idea where she was. We checked her room. She wasn't in her room. So hysterical mom goes in the car and starts driving all over Guelph, and, uh, and then, as crazy as this might sound, I was looking for my child hanging from a tree, and all I could think was, could I get there fast enough to save her? And the reason I was thinking this is because this happened to a little boy two weeks ago, locally, and it was in the news. Now, thank God my husband called me and said, get home. He decided to feel around on her bed, and our five-foot-nothing 15-year-old girl was under four blankets and comforters, and she was safe. But I'll never forget that. I can't even imagine if this has happened to somebody, what they're going through. Now, I will tell you that I call this a journey because my daughter and I are very close, and I don't think we would be this close if we didn't go through this together. She's now 20 years old, right there. <laughs> She's going to university for, guess what, psychology because she wants to work as a high school teacher so she can be in an environment where she can help kids just like herself. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty proud. 
So this may be their path, but it's your journey. It's our journey. And we go through this together. In the end of the journey, there's a light. There can be if you accept it and not blame and not be ashamed because it's not your fault. Thank you.